Welcome to Artist Fit Podcast. Uh, and this one is the Biblical Doctrine segment. We are indeed excited to have all of you here and uh, always excited to be together breaking the juggernaut theological words into simple and understandable ways. Mm. And um, we, always, we are always privileged to have guys come and help us to just bring down the content of this doctrinal juggernaut wordings. And uh, today we are also having a friend of ours. He's been here before. He's passionate about the Bible. And mm. so I think when our discussion on bibliology, you will always be here. Yeah. So let's welcome uh, Reverend Mutie. Thank Once you. again, you'll introduce yourself for those who are joining us for the first time, yes. and then we'll continue. I'm, I'm grateful to be here, Dr. Luke. And uh, my name is Jackson Mutie. I'm serving with uh, African Land Church Revival Fellowship, Molem in uh, along Kangundo Road here in the city of Nairobi. And I'm serving with um, several organizations, teaching several colleges, and a student as well with Puritan Reformed Theological Seminary. So I'm grateful to see you, my, my, my good friend. Thank you. Nice Thank to you. be here. Karibu Tena. Yeah. yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome to this bench. Always looking forward. <laughs> All right. So recently we began a very interesting uh, season, yes. conversing on the doctrine, doctrines of the Bible. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the inspiration of the Bible. We've sure. talked about the inerrancy mm. you know, of the Bible. And uh, today we are getting into it again. Yeah. You know, as we were finishing the last episode, mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of conversation on the canonicity of the yes. Bible. Yes, 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 I remember. And, and um, during the week, many people were asking me the question, hey, mm. Mm. Uh, Revo, you need to talk <laughs> more about canonicity of the yes. Bible. And they're asking me so many difficult questions. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought the person who will deal with those questions, not me, mm -hmm. uh, but you. Oops. So, okay. And I think that is... I a, hope this is not a setup. <laughs> it should be. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's the best thing is just to begin yeah. from there. What yeah. is canonicity? Wow. When, when you are discussing about the doctrines yes, of the Bible. Yes, yes. Um, with regards to the doctrines of the scripture, canonicity... Uh, stands tall oh. without getting a clear perspective of what can, uh, canonicity is all about, then it might be a little difficult to understand some other aspects of the scripture, uh, namely uh, things to do with um, uh, things to do with the authority of the scripture, uh, things to do with the inspiration, like we have already uh, discussed, and uh, inherency and infallibility, and other attributes of the scripture, so mm. to speak. And so, and you told me one that was uh, that had a very difficult English. Uh, what, what was that? Uh, something to, <laughs> to do with uh, pers 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 perspicuity. Uh, perspicuity. Of the yeah, that, 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 that the scripture is clear. Yeah. Oh, so it just it just means the scripture. It means is clear. exactly, okay. exactly. Right, but of course, there's a reason as to why such a statement will be used. All right. And so when it comes to uh, canonicity of the scripture is a basic understanding of the canon, the Bible as a canon. And, and that statement is a Latin uh, word that means uh, to rule or to offer authority. And so we are asking canonicity is a question of what books authoritatively uh, in the scripture, mm. rightfully. Mm -hmm. And so what is it that is the scripture, the books of the scripture? Mm -hmm. And um, again, that term canon sometimes is even used when uh, the council meets and decides that is the rule that they give becomes the canon of the church. Mm. And so canonicity is actually around the question of authorship, the question of admissibility, you know, what books have been admitted into uh, forming the, uh, the the books of the scripture, 39 mm -hmm. and 27. Mm -hmm. I mentioned last week that mm -hmm. that is what I subscribe to, mm -hmm. uh, about the Bible with uh, 66 books uh, mm -hmm. and, and all that. So the question of what books are, mm -hmm. Uh, clearly forming part of the scripture. And basically, and, and I know, yeah. uh, I'm sorry, yeah, just, yeah. I, I know that there's a lot that comes with canonicity, mm. and I'm uh, looking forward to dealing with it as much as I can. And yeah. Let's see if we can deal with all yes, that. Yes. Because basically, what you're saying is that if, if canonicity is a determination of admissibility yes. of 
what books are supposed to be included mm -hmm. authoritatively in mm -hmm. the scriptures. Yeah. And uh, what then you, you are also saying that canonicity also made determination on what books were not, were supposed, not to. supposed to be. No, uh, but when, when I say it makes a determination, I must edit that very quickly yes. before it sinks uh -huh. by defining two terms that uh -huh. needs to be known yeah. when it comes to can, uh, canonicity. Mm -hmm. The first term is recognition and the okay. second term is this, uh, you know, decision mm -hmm. in terms of uh, a, a team of people sitting down to decide mm -hmm. uh, what comes in and what goes out. Mm. Uh, from a Protestant perspective, canonicity involves recognition, not decision, so that the, there's no council anywhere or a team of people anywhere that were sit, you know, that sat down to decide mm. what books form the Bible. We don't have that kind of a thing anywhere. Oh. It's only that uh, with time, mm -hmm. and this is way before even the church, we have been recognizing these books as the scripture. Mm. And, and so it's, it's, it's more of recognizing the books of the Bible, so the Rev, canon. Rev, who, 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 who guides that's the a, recognition? That's a sweet question, my yeah. brother. I love it. Yeah. And uh, I, I will take you back to, so who recognizes? Yes, or who, who, who began the recognition? Yeah, who began the recognition? This is God. I, I should say it's, it is like we, we mentioned in terms of the inspiration. It is God's word. Mm -hmm. It is written, authored by God. He is the primary author. And, and therefore, he is actually the one who stamps the authority that this is his uh, word. Oh, wow. And so I would begin with God in, essentially as the one who recognizes his word as such. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, the word of God is recognized as God's word by God himself to begin with. And mm -hmm. definitely across history, it has been so. We, we have the scripture authors recognizing other scripture authors. You have a citation by scripture authors of the scripture so that you have Isaiah citing Deuteronomy, the mm -hmm. books of Moses. Mm -hmm. You have Jesus Christ himself recognizing mm -hmm. the, um, the books of the law, mm -hmm. the books of the prophets, the books of uh, wisdom, if mm. you may, Psalm, mm -hmm. uh, and this. I think, I think that is in Luke chapter twenty-four. Yeah, Luke 44. chapter number twenty-four and verse number forty-four to forty-seven. He mm. directly recognizes uh, the canon, and oh. therefore, who recognizes? Yes, we have that super authority. I feel like we need to read you both the Bible <laughs> in that. Uh, yes, because yes. Uh, again, the reason why, uh, even as you open, yes, the reason why it is, I think, it is important to get there is, mm. you know, many times when people talk about canonicity, yes. Uh, people have this idea that canonicity, canonicity is uh, only about some human being yes, yes. sitting somewhere yes, yes. and liking and disliking certain books yes. so that the ones they like mm -hmm. was included in yeah. 66 yes. and the ones they did not like yeah, was And that is an included. error. That's a serious error. We yeah. do not have a team. And, and, and that must be corrected very firmly. The reason we have a what, podcast. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, the re, that, that what we have in our hands yeah. is not a concussion of some certain men somewhere who mm -hmm. thought they had the authority and they sat around a discussion mm -hmm. on the book of John, the book of Luke, mm -hmm. all these books, and they said, wow, this one sounds good, and so it can fit in. Mm -hmm. No, I'm going to take you through a number of uh, statements in the scripture that show that actually the Bible authors, as they were writing the books of the Bible, knew that they are dealing with the truth in terms of uh, producing the scripture. Yes, and therefore it wasn't hard for anyone to know because th there's what we call the threshold and I'll be coming to that in terms of um, uh, the characteristics of their scripture for mm -hmm. it to be the scripture. And most of times when <clears throat> we when we bring this up is in relation to the New Testament. Yeah. But, but just to read what yeah. Jesus Christ says. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, Jesus is recognizing the three-part document, which was the Hebrew uh, scripture at the moment, mm. uh, the canon of the day, the mm. canon of the time. And he pays clear recognition here, especially in verse number 40, uh, 44 
before it says then he said to them these are my words mm. that I spoke to you while I was with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses mm -hmm. part 1 and the prophets part 2 mm. and Psalms part 3 must be fulfilled and that. therefore, the Hebrew uh, scripture is uh, divided at the time of Jesus Christ, mm. just before the writing of the New Testament, mm. it is subdivided into three major parts, mm -hmm. and that is the canon of the day. Mm. If I can add, mm -hmm. when you go to the book of Joshua, and mm. chapter number one, right at the onset, uh, God is speaking to, I mean, Joshua is being instructed into the next uh, course of action mm. after the death of uh, Moses. And God tells him, as I was with my servant Moses, I will be with you, but be sure to keep the book of the law. Mm -hmm. And at the time of Moses, the canon is actually only the book of the law. That's what we have. Wow. Family on the table, recognized by God himself mm. uh, as, as the guiding text for life and the source of authority in terms of morality and faith. Awesome. Yeah. So generally what you're saying is that when we think about canonicity, mm -hmm. we are thinking of canonicity in terms of recognition. We're thinking of... Not really determination. Exactly, exactly. We think, because the argument, and by the way, this is a, a, serious, a serious area. Mm. One of the... One of the uh, great authors around the subject of uh, the origin of the Bible would be would be a, a professor by the name I think Kruger. He, he has uh, spoken to uh, that matter so exclusively, mm -hmm. and is looking at the idea, especially when we begin to reject the word of God, part of the things that, you know, come to mind and the easiest way to reject the word of God is to reject in terms of its admissibility. Mm. So that once we question that, mm. whether that was this admitted, was this left out, mm. then already we are throwing the spanner in the wax mm. in terms of the entire uh, structure of the Bible. Mm -hmm. But when we go beyond the question of there was and, 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 and um, Dr. Tari, yeah. it, it's, it's important for you to uh, recognize this. Another recognition. Uh, yes, yes, yes. It's important for you to recognize this. Uh, when, you, when you begin to question the, uh, in terms of, um, uh, the, you know, or to, to highlight the idea that there might have been a council somewhere mm. who decided what were the books of canon or what were not the books of canon, you are already putting the authority in the council of men. Right. And therefore, the Bible, I am hoping we shall discuss on the authority of the scripture yes. at some point. Yes. Therefore, the authority of the scripture is Compr clearly compromised. Yeah. And what you are left with is the authority of the council, yeah. which is not the case. And therefore, the council, and definitely, was there such a, a discussion? Definitely, yes. There's a council that discussed uh, the canon. Mm. And the reason for discussing the canon, maybe you may want to know that I can push it, uh, you know, uh, uh, to a later mm. uh, discussion, so to speak. But there was a reason as to why there were, it, in, it was necessitated, mm. uh, especially around fourth century. And uh, they, are, they, are, they are bringing on the table the idea of uh, what is the threshold? What is the threshold? Mm. Because whenever we talk about canonicity, much of what we are discussing, especially, will be the New Testament. Mm. And, and why we are discussing it is because of the availability of other texts that are not in our book as okay. we speak. Mm. And also the availability of other texts that have been included, especially in the Roman Catholic uh, Bible, the, the 72. No, no, talking about that. Yes, sir. How, how, how do you... How do you harmonize yes. the concept of recognition yes. and the, you know, Protestant uh, non-recognition? Non-recognition of the apocryphal. Of the apocryphal. Yeah. yeah. Um, let, me, let, me, let me put it this way, mm. uh, if you allow me, yeah. that yes, we have the 14 non-biblical, non-canonical uh, books, mm -hmm. 
that we uh, we don't have in mm. our Bible. And that is Protestants you're talking about. Right? Uh, I'm talking about the Protestants, mm. and um, of course we we have some that I've also missed in the Roman Catholic uh, <laughs> okay. uh, Bible mm -hmm. and all that. So I'm just mentioning. Ideally, mm -hmm. traditionally, historically, we have the 14 yes. uh, apocryphal books mm -hmm. that have not found themselves mm -hmm. as, the, as the books of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so the big question, yeah. and this, uh, everyone following this must understand, and, and we calm down to get to understand what canonicity is all about. The big question is, what is it, or how did we come up with the 27 books in the Bible. Right. Did we have a team of men seated somewhere mm. and uh, looking at these scrolls and these scrolls that the gospel according to Thomas, the gospel according to Peter, mm. and all these books out there and saying, well, wait a minute, this mm. doesn't uh, look nice. And, and, by the way, really, yeah. and by the way, <laughs> yeah. it is important to mention Peter was an apostle mm. and Thomas was an apostle. Right. And so if it is to be found that these documents originate from them, then we need to discuss about them. Mm. But of course, historicity of these texts has always been put into question. Mm -hmm. However, what was the threshold in terms of having the 27 New Testament books? Mm -hmm. And I will give you three. Mm. Three uh, major characteristics yeah. in terms of threshold mm. that allowed for uh, the 27 uh, New Testament books. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm going to try and defend them uh, very neatly, if mm. you may, yeah, so, so that we get to understand what we we're talking it about. Neat. We want it neat. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah. Number one, the content, mm. the content in the text. Okay. That was a basic one. Mm -hmm. Is it? Uh, heavenly word, if you may, in terms of its style, is it majestic style and all that, the, the, in terms of the content. Mm. So, uh, and, and the churches of the time would know uh, what content mm. they're reading. And uh, they're looking at uh, conciseness within the content in terms of how true it is. Mm. Then the second aspect was, well, does it have the apostolic authority. Mm -hmm. And when we were talking about inspiration, mm. I hinted to that. Mm. And let me say this, the reason as to why we have the 14 apostles, one of course killed himself, Judas Iscariot. Yeah. He died still without kind of an office. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that this should be a joke. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, especially. He, he, yeah, he, he died, you know, still an apostle. Yes. But the reason we have 14 apostles mm. was for the sole reason that they will collectively produce mm. the New Testament. Awesome. So the team that Jesus spent with, yeah. their ministry, their primary ministry is the production of the New Testament books. Hmm. Yeah. And in the New Testament books, the... Because I know some people think that they, they were there to help Jesus do the work. And the work definitely is being done today, helped through the production the of the New Testament the scripture. Awesome. Mm. And therefore, the, yes, yes, I would say that's okay. Mm. Yes. It makes sense. Mm. But how did they help him? Like, if, if to help, I really wonder how you can help God. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but if they were to help, uh, then how did they help them? Mm. They did it by production of the scripture. scripture. Awesome which is inspired by mm. God. Mm. And how did they do it? Mm -hmm. By the inspiration mm. and by being brought into, rem into remembrance of these matters by the Holy Spirit as promised. Mm -hmm. So again, the reason as to why in the first place the Holy Spirit of God is sent on the day of Pentecost mm -hmm. is so that the apostles can produce the scripture. Because he says what in John, I think, uh, chapter number 14 or thereabout, when he comes, the spirit of truth, mm. you bring into remembrance all things that I have taught you. Now, that's a very good uh, <laughs> chronology there. We want to walk through. Yeah. So you're saying yeah. the first threshold of... Uh, I have not given the third one, but... Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe just to get to the... You said the first one is the content. The content. Looking at the content yes. and the 
the, 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 uh, what, what the content had in terms of the authority, salvific nature of it. And actually tying with the, end, the Old Testament, especially the covenant, the covenantal line, uh -huh. it, you, you, you bringing from uh, the Adamic, the, yeah. the, the Abrahamic, the yeah. Noahic, the, so the Davidic. the is connected. It has to be one. But the yes, second thing you're saying is apostleship. Apostolic and authority. And you're bringing a very, very critical yes. thing. That yes. the sole reason why Jesus had the apostles yeah. was so that they can put together. And, and, and up to this minute, yeah. you cannot put a book on the table mm. in the New Testament yeah. that is not a product okay. of the apostolic authority. I, I'm careful not to say a product apostle. of an apostle. Yes. Because, for example, you do not know who authored the book of Hebrews. All right. Yeah, however, exactly. Thinking, however, yeah, yeah. however, the author of that book indicates that whatever is writing mm. has been received and has been accommodated within apostolic right. uh, thinking. Right. And, and therefore, for example, you know that Luke was not an, an apostle. Yeah. However, when you're reading him, you realize he has done his research mm -hmm. And he has uh, especially interacted and gotten his information from the, the apostles, apostles yes. and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And therefore, all the way to the book of Revelation, you are reading apostolic authority. Awesome. You're looking at um, apostolic authority. Awesome. Yeah. Then now you can get to the third one. Uh, the third one, uh, do I remember really? The reception. I uh, should be able you, to... You mentioned uh, the reception. Is, exactly. Thank yeah. you so much. I yeah. think I did. You actually mentioned it before, but yeah. now it yeah. really fits in. In terms of uh, uh, receptivity yeah. of uh, the information by the church, when Paul, for example, who defends his apostleship that, that is the reason as to why his documents are accepted. Mm. When he writes the book of Galatians, for example, and writes the book of uh, Corinthians, he indicates, especially in the book of Corinthians, he indicates that his letter, his previous letter, has been accepted and has been acted upon, mm -hmm. and they have repented, and now he is overjoyed because mm -hmm. there is joy in, in, the, in the Corinthian <laughs> church. And therefore, the church, uh, the church was able to receive yeah. these documents mm -hmm. as authority of the apostles. Awesome. So that, that was the third threshold. Oh. And that's a basic, basic for, this would be theology 101. <laughs> Please, we can even make it uh, without a number, but yes, it's so powerful yes. because, because again, the topic of canonicity has really, really been distorted. Very true, times. very and true. I think even when we are thinking, we are talking about, you know, we are talking about content mm -hmm. and we are talking about the, we are, we are removing this discussion from a people sitting somewhere in a council. And we are taking this discussion to the Bible itself, paying tribute to its uh, canon. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And what other authority can we have yeah. other than the Bible authors themselves? Mm. You know, paying tribute to the document. Yeah. For example, Peter recognizes Paul's words as the scripture. Mm. Whenever... Jesus Christ is quoting, uh, and you can see, whenever he is quoting the Old Testament, you would say, as the scripture says, mm. he, he does in the portion, mm. the part of the scripture canon that has been accepted mm. to the individual author. Mm -hmm. And you hear that over and over again when, mm. when you're looking at Matthew. Matthew, for example, is able to connect very quickly with the Old Testament, right. and especially when he gives the gene genealogy of Jesus yeah. Christ right at the start, he, he goes all the way back to Abraham. Awesome. And Luke is able to go actually farther than Abraham to God himself. Yeah. And so the authority of the document is actually God himself. Now, as we almost get to close oh, this, okay. where, where do we put the vision today prophecies and <laughs> i hope you are a kenyan and you know we have so many and by the way i've seen someone in yeah. this country yeah. who has done the gospel according to apostle so and so you know he, he, he has done Please, something you need to bring it for me to read but that what, not, what is there to read not include it in the canon because it doesn't have a connection with the old testament the moment he said the gospel according to him yes is already done it is not readable it cannot be now, read now, now talking about that Vision Where do we put dreams. visions today? Because people say, I have a vision. 
Where do we put up? Prophecies, we are prophets still. Where would we put apostles? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, this is an area that, uh, uh, you know, brings about a lot of heat when it is discussed for yeah. no good reason. Yeah. I normally let people go back to understanding of who is a prophet uh, from a biblical perspective, mm -hmm. uh, what is a vision, and what is the purpose for a vision. I will give a very, a very the farm kind of an area, and that is what I subscribe mm. to. Uh, and w w what is a dream? What is the purpose of a dream? And all that. Now, and revelation, mm. you have new revelation. I hope we can discuss that someday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That should be coming up next week. It, it, mm. You know, these are things that you hear over and over again, and they coupled up with many other things. The problem is we don't understand what these things are. Mm. Let me handle one after the other very mm -hmm. quickly yes. to begin with when we have when we say we have had a vision and we say it has come from god then the next thing that should be naturally done mm. is to include that thing in the bible however <laughs> there's a problem however there's a problem yes. the canon is complete yeah. When John is writing and comes to the tail end, mm. you look at it and he says at the end mm. that if anyone adds or subtracts mm. to the words of this prophecy, then God will add the judgments mm. pronounced in this book. Mm. And, and, and therefore, there is no room for adding because no God's word goes in vain. We do not have mm. any more info that we are waiting for. Mm. We are waiting for one item, mm. the return of Jesus Christ. Between now and the coming of Jesus Christ, there is no any other uh, salvific event mm. that we are looking at. The last salvific event we are looking at is the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He did that 2,000 years ago. Mm. And the second salvific event is for Jesus Christ to come for his church and his coming. He said, Amen. immediately it's coming. Yeah. We are living in the very last days. Right. And therefore, there's no room for, for vision. Mm. Why would you go for a vision mm. when you have the Bible with you? When God has communicated, you have used the word perspicuity of yes, the scripture. That's difficult. When, when he has communicated so clearly, mm. why would you want to really have a complicated dream and seek for its interpretation? <laughs> How would that be, you know, useful for a Christian? But, like, let me summarize this way. Yeah. <laughs> in the recorded history, especially in the Bible, yes. there are only around 260 years mm. where there were visions and dreams and miracles and all these things. I'm not saying we don't have miracles, mm -hmm. so to speak, mm -hmm. but, but these extraordinary happenings, mm -hmm. and they were all happening for a purpose. Yeah. The first one is during the time of Moses mm -hmm. and his life, 40 years in the wilderness, miracle after miracle and all those things are recorded. The second one is during the time of the prophet Elijah mm -hmm. and Elisha, and that's not a fairly long time, mm. about 60 years. And the last time is the time of Jesus Christ and the apostles, mm. the recorded one, at a, a, a total of around 250 years. Mm. And what was the reason to establish Moses as the man of God, of course, and establish the Mosaic uh, covenant, mm. to establish Elijah and the entire prophetic ministry as authentic, from mm. God, and to establish Jesus Christ as the founder of the church. Now, we are done with the foundation. Yes. We are raising all the way to uh, the roof, mm. which is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Wow. Some of these things don't make sense. No, I really like the way you put it, yeah. that uh, if we have visions, if we have prophecies, then these things need to be documented. And True. we cannot... They become scripture. Yeah, it becomes <laughs> If they're coming scriptures. from God. And we cannot edit it yeah. because the Bible also tells us that everything that we need for life. Yeah, and for living. And for living. Yes. <laughs> has been documented. So sure. God also gives testimony that the document we have yes. in the name of the Bible yes. is sufficient. And very, very soon we'll be talking about the sufficiency. Very of the true. Bible. 
I think Pre- you cannot put it any better Amen. than that. Amen. And 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 if if just to to finish as I give you a moment to say your last word yeah. through the, the the camera, let me just just to bring this. Mm. Don't ever forget that canonicity is not understood from the perspective of man, but from the perspective of Christ himself and from the perspective of history. So when you talk about canonicity, and like Reverend has said, we look at the New Testament, does it have a connection, the content mm-hmm. uh, that puts it, does it as the apostolic authority, sure. you know, and has it been accepted? And the Bible also gives testimony to its acceptance. So, mm. uh, Rev, your last word. And, and even as I close, in terms of acceptance, you yes. go to uh, the early church fathers yes. like Athanasius and yes. Origen. These are men who actually, uh, and, and within their time, yeah. this is the very, very early you know, stage in the church had already accepted over 22 books in the New Testament. Mm. And therefore, when I mention acceptors, mm. I'm not looking at my little kiosk, yes. you know, so to speak, back yeah. there. No, no, I'm just looking at as early, uh, in terms of the early church, mm. how much of acceptance was okay. all this. But by, this is how I would put uh, our discussion to a close that there is a serious need currently to begin to think about canonicity of the scripture, to begin to think about the authority of the scripture, to begin to think about the inspiration of the scripture. I think it is a time that we must be reawakened to mm. these truths mm. and bring them to the, uh, to the, to the, you know, the, the people that believe in God, to bring, to bring them to the, to the fore, mm. that people will accept the reality that mm. there is only one book from mm, God with mm, 66 books. Mm. Perfect. And for me, it's just to read that text in Luke chapter 24, verse 44. Mm. And uh, the Bible says, um, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the laws of Moses and the prophets and the psalm must be fulfilled. Amen. And to me, the New Testament Authority, authority of the New Testament springs from the fulfillment sure. that are seen in the laws of Moses, prophecies, and some. Sure. And that makes sense. Amen. That makes canonicity authoritative. Amen. Thank you so much for joining at His Feet Podcast, the Biblical Doctrine segment. Hmm. Looking forward to meeting you next week. Shalom.